The Society of Economic Geologists is committed to advancing the science of economic geology through world-class publications, workshops, webinars, field trips, and conferences, and is committed to developing the next generation of successful exploration geologists. We highly encourage anyone interested in membership or additional resources to visit Society's webpage for more information. I've been a student member for more than four years, and I've been highly uh, benefited from the society and try to be a part of it. So title of the, today's webinar is Resumes and Roadmaps, Building a Strong Foundation for Geologists. A reminder that this webinar is provided by Society of Economic Geologists Early Career Professions Committee and that SEG is committed to supporting the professionals and development of early career professionals across the three main sectors of economic geology, industry, academia, and government. From networking opportunities and access to technical conferences, through to tailored skills workshops and worldwide field trips visiting, visiting world-class mineral deposits. SEG provides a vast range of events and programs that can help the advan advancement of your early career. Visit the Society website, to find out more. Today, we have two excellent speakers and they will share their insights and expertise as recruitment professionals, helping students and other mineral exploration professionals understand the merits of a strong resume and how to create a job discovery roadmap and that will help individuals leverage their skill sets and relationships. This is Kora Tashbichan. I'm your moderator for today's webinar. I'm a master's student in mineral exploration at New Mexico Tech. After receiving my undergraduate degree from Middle East Technical University in Turkey, I worked as an exploration geologist in Turkey and in Uzbekistan. And my current graduate degree research focuses on uh, copper mineralization and pyrogenesis uh, in Kiruna district, Northern Sweden. I serve as the SEG student committee's North America representative and conferences coordinator assisting SEG conference organizers in the planning and execution of the student early career professional day and other student specific activities. Jill Nelson is co-founder and owner of Brooks and Nelson, a global human resource management recruit and recruiting consulting firm. Her passion is matching top talent with the right opportunity for clients considering not only skills, but cultures and work styles. She is diligent in first learning a client's culture, strengths, and areas of improvement. Jill started her career with the Shell, with Shell Mining Company, and her first 10 years experience in mining were spent primarily in clean coal technologies. She moved into, in, into the waste industry for BFI, then into managing hazardous waste landfills at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. She then returned to BFI as their landfill sales manager, which opened the door for Jill to meet new people from different walks in life. Clients became friends and solid connections. She is a board member for the Society for Mining, Metallurgy and Exploration, SME. Our second speaker today, Jolene Lance. She brings a wealth of both leadership and recruitment expertise to the Brooks and Nelson team. As the former CEO of HS International, a successful Denver-based mining rec recruitment firm, she and her team placed technical, corporate, and leadership talent, including the C-suite globally. With over five years of experience in mining, her career began with accounting and financial ta talent placement. Most recently, as a senior sourcer for the North Northrop Grumman, a Fortune 100 aerospace and defense company, she acquired new skills working directly on the inside of a company's talent acquisition team. Jolene recently co-authored Inspiration at Work, a job seekers resort guide to assist job seekers in finding and landing a job that inspires them. I have to unmute, there we go. Thank you for that introduction. We're excited to be here. Um, we know that you're really busy in your careers today given the volume of work. So we're delighted that you're making time to be with us today. 
As recruiters, we see a lot of resumes and appreciate being able to share our insights and perspectives with you. Having a stellar resume that is up to date is something we all want and should have in our back pocket, but making this happen often falls down on our list of things to do. We are here to encourage you to tackle this project using some of the best practices that we have collected over our years of working with people and their resumes. Having an updated resume, however, is simply the first step. Having a strategic roadmap combined with a powerful resume will open doors of opportunity, definitely when you're looking, and it prepares you to still be ready to respond when a golden opportunity knocks on your door, even when you're not looking. So before to get started here, it'd be good to understand who our audience is today. So Deanne, could you quickly pull up the survey? Uh, Jill, excuse me. Could you please turn your turn on your camera? Oh, nobody saw that. There we go. Okay. Does that work? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I think that everyone take a few minutes here and just let us know who's in our audience. All right, I think for the sake of time, we'll just keep going while people are finishing. Sometimes our careers take surprising turns. In 2016, Brooks and Nelson was formed by Lois Brooks, who um, retired from Goldfields, and myself after a collection of safe yet awesome career opportunities. Being in the people supply chain business, we crave the opportunity to give back to the industry that we're passionate about. It takes a team and Brooks and Nelson's comprised of diverse, strong and fun people that I am humbled and blessed yet proud to be working with. Recruiting involves a lot of ethics. So we wanted a strong board to govern us and to guide us. You likely know or have heard some, some, of, some of the people on our team in our board. The company continues to grow. Our newest addition is Jolene Lenz, who was our mentor when we started our company. Jolene has, um, as Corey was mentioning, years of recruitment, both for companies like Northrop Grenham and running her own successful mining recruiting company. Jolene has even written a book on the subject, which I really highly recommend. So Jolene, would you tell us about your book? Great. Thank you, Jill. And thank you all for joining us today. We greatly appreciate it. And I love being part of the Brooks and Nelson team, Jill. So thank you for adding me. So my former client and colleague, Christine Sturmer, and I recently published Inspiration at Work. It's a job seekers resource guide. We did that last year via Amazon. Christine and I noticed that few colleges instruct students on how to find jobs. So this book was written to provide tools, templates and suggestions for early career professionals, as well as even some tips to help the seasoned professional. I'm excited to share some of the tips and suggestions with you all today. Next slide. So for the agenda for the webinar today, we're first gonna begin with how to create a stellar resume. Then we're gonna share ideas to build a strategic roadmap, and then at the end of the presentation, Jill and I would be happy to answer any questions. So what is the purpose of a resume? A resume serves as your marketing document. 
and it is intended for one primary purpose, and that is to get an interview. Typically, the first screener of a resume spends less than a minute reviewing it. That's why it's so ever important to invest the time up front in creating a stellar resume. Resumes are not intended to be autobiographies, which on occasion, Jill and I have seen a few of those. So to carry on with that thought, resume writing is not black or white. However, it's really important to keep these four C's in mind. First, be consistent in your font, your style, your verse tense, and your sentence structure. Be concise and clear. Give short summaries of your duties, accomplishments, and the typical tasks. People tend to be humble when it comes to writing their resume. A resume should clearly state the facts of your career. And if you look at it as a fact sheet, it may become less daunting of a task. As Jillian was mentioning, the objective of your resume is to whet the hiring manager's appetite enough to set up that interview to hear the rest of your story. So keep your resume clean and uncluttered. Side columns and large borders can be distracting and certainly aren't easy to reproduce. So let's go through some perceptions that I would classify almost as rumors about what a resume should and shouldn't be. One of the first perceptions is that a resume should only be one or two pages. It is tough to achieve and, and often leaves behind some really good information. Be concise, but don't dilute your achievements and experiences. The second perception is that you should limit your work history, and this is for the little bit more advanced in their career people. Limit your work history to the most current 10 years. As recruiters, we tend to look back on how people advanced in their careers. Was a progression logical or were steps skipped? Also, we look at the first five years of a person's experience to be the foundation of their career. So eliminating this information leaves hiring managers wondering. And then there can be questions around whether or not to include a cover letter. Again, this isn't black or white. <laughs> For instance, Jolene prefers to see them, while I, not so much. But a cover letter should only highlight your resume, not supplement any, with any new information. So let's, let's take some time now to break the resume into logical uh, sections. First things first, your contact information. Your name should be clear and bolded. As far as, you know, it's important to avoid work phone numbers and emails. It simply is unprofessional. Another point on emails, avoid Hotmail, Yahoo, and MSN domains, as they can get stuck in some company's security blocks. It's easy, and it doesn't cost anything to start a Gmail account for yourself. Just be sure when you do to check it. So here's an example. And Max, thank you very much. Alm is our uh, guinea pig today. We'll be showing you bits. He spent a lot of time back in the day uh, reworking his resume as he was getting out of college. So the next thing that your resume should contain is a summary or a qualification statement. The emphasis should be on how you can add value to the company versus focusing on what you want. We suggest having a master resume, then tweaking it to a specific opportunity. If you do this, you should also tailor your qualifications to the position you're asking, you're applying for. And here is a great example. You know, he is conveying, Max is conveying that he's passionate, has a strong work ethic, eager to get going in his career, willing to undertake any changes and become a valuable contributor. Then he added, he, we asked him to take some, a good hard look at what made him stand apart from his peers. And he put down those attributes that really reflect on his, his personality and his work ethics. So and these are very, very well, they're not nonchalant, they're very specific, and, and he can easily defend those in an interview if asked about them. The next point is you include your work experience. Think about putting your responsibilities in terms of quantifiable accomplishments. 
that gives evidence of your ability to add value. You know, have you helped save some money, um, enhance the productivity, whatever. But when you can provide data, it's highly recommended. And here's an accomplishment I want to point out on Max's resume. If you can read it, under his e Erecto Conveyor Corporation, that was actually his father's company, and he worked through high school and early college. And, and, and initially, he just said he was a machinist. That was all he had. But the accomplishment was that he started, it's subtle, he started as a shop hand and worked up to a valued, skilled machinist. So something like that early in your career is really important. It shows progression and, and stick to itness. Many graduates are proud of their alma mater. However, education should follow work experiences. This philosophy is contrary to most college resume templates. So if you've been out a couple of years and you haven't updated your resume, it's a good reason to, to do so. Um, understand that you're proud of it, but it's time to move on and focus with work first. Um, please include your year of graduation, if it's recent or even not so recent. People, it just saves people the agony of trying to figure it out, and we all will. Um, then make sure to put honors and interest training, especially if you speak any other language other than your native, you know, English or Spanish, that's great to have. And finish it by um, putting reference upon request. We don't advise putting those actual references on there. You want to control that, but do know that you would work with people and are happy to have people check up on your work ethic. Now over to you, Jolene. Great. So a number of the rep resumes that we receive include paragraphs versus bulleting, and they begin sentences with, I was responsible for. We would encourage you to avoid I statements and paragraphs. When resumes include examples that can be quantified, they rise to the top. Here are some examples of some exceptional success and action verbs that you could utilize in your resume. Early career professionals could use assisted or established as examples to begin when you're doing bullets. One idea might be if you've assisted with the generation of drill targets, you might wanna add those, but definitely we highly encourage you to not do the paragraphs. Okay. All right, next slide. Yeah, then let's take a look at, uh, here's where Max started. And thank you so much, Max, for if you're on, for your willingness here. Max was uh, graduating from the Colorado School of Mines. He had gone to their career placement um, center and used their template, you know, education's coming first, employment. There's a lot of information crammed into this um, resume. And quite frankly, when you look at resumes day in, day out, it was a little intense. So this is the before, like the, like the uh, eye doctor's office. This is the after. You can see he put his uh, qualifications, both his statement and his, his attributes. He brought up his experience. He, um, and we'll go back real quick, look under experience. This is where he started with his conveyor, uh, machine operator at so-and-so, but it was five years. And, and when you're graduating college, five years is pretty impressive. What that became is he had the company a little bit different formatting there, but here's where he made it into an accomplishment, started as this and ended at that over the, the course of his time. So that's nicely done. He still, being a, a graduate at that time, had his volunteer field trips, everything relevant to show that he was nicely prepared. Um, nice resume. So proud of him and, and thank you for that. But as we mentioned, having that resume first is, is a first step in your roadmap. So Jolene will take it from here. You're on mute, Jolene. Oh, took a minute. Thank you. All right. So after you have prepared the stellar resume, you have created a foundation to build on. Now it's time to create a game plan and to help focus in targeting a variety of avenues to help you in discovering a job. So let's take a look at the next slide. So first things first. 
Take the time up front to gain the clarity you desire in your career. What is your ideal job? Once you are clear on the type of job you desire, we would encourage you to research and then target those opportunities. Company websites, LinkedIn, and global mining news sources such as Northern Miner, which is a weekly trade journal, are all great places and areas to spend time in research, as is SEG, SME, Bloomberg, and Dun & Bradstreet has Hoover's, which are great places to go and do, yeah, dig in a little bit more into companies. These resources will help you in finding organizations who could def definitely benefit from, your, benefit from your education and experience and help you to focus your efforts. Statistics show how powerful networking can be. That's why we would encourage you to spend some or most of your time in this area. So when we look at a strategic roadmap, we, we bolded this area just because of the, I mean, I think the percentages there are over 80% of position, people find their jobs via their network. When you build those trusted relationships with potential hiring managers, those relationships can be invaluable. Find a few professional networking events that are strategic for your job search, and we would recommend you attend regularly. Local chapters of GSA or SME and conferences are great avenues to meet your target audience. When we find, or we find many candidates prefer to apply job to job postings online with larger organizations, maybe like Freeport or Nevada Gold Mines, this can be advantageous as these organizations have their own team of recruiters. If you prefer to work for a mid-tier to junior company, they may not, or they may utilize recruiters to assist. They typically don't have the bandwidth of HR support. So recruiters are another great avenue to consider. So let's go to the next slide, Jill. So with us being on Brooks and Nelson, we wanted to explain a little bit more about how recruiters work as another avenue for you. So we would recommend you meet with three to four industry specific recruiters that focus in your field and desired region. This is a service that doesn't cost you a penny, only your time to meet with them. We would encourage you to ask for referrals and, and do some homework, um, you know, meeting them. Make sure they're honest, they have excellent networks and client relationships with your best interest in mind. It's important to stay in close communication and build relationships with recruiters as well. At Brooks and Nelson, most of our client relationships here are exclusive versus contingency. We build deep relationships with our clients and we work on a retainer. Our goal is to align stellar talent with the ideal candidate, and that's how our clients measure our success. Other than asking for referrals, another way to locate a recruiter, I mean, LinkedIn is another great resource or just the good old Dr. Google. All right, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a job seekers goldmine and another avenue that I would encourage you to seriously consider. LinkedIn has over 830 million members worldwide and it's used by professionals in 200 different countries. LinkedIn is the most popular in the United States and it's a primary way for recruiters to search for talent. So it's important to have a strong LinkedIn presence. It's another marketing opportunity to brand yourself. So you'll see here, uh, we have a, you know, example like we did with Max, we have created a profile, Nelson Brooks, and we just wanted to showcase with you that when you clarify the targeted jobs that you're seeking, that helps us as recruiters find you. So we have him showing the, the positions there and then announcing active eligibility. So you would also be able to add this open to work banner where your photograph is located. If you are gainfully employed and do not want your company to know that you're looking, one of LinkedIn's features allows you to announce that you are open to work in your profile section that only recruiters would have access to. Since a number of recruiting professionals and hiring managers do not utilize LinkedIn's professional recruiter feature due to the expense, we would encourage you to announce that you're open to opportunities when you can, obviously when your employer, when you're not gainfully employed and risk losing your position. So one way that we showed you here is by the listing there right next to his title, just open to opportunities. 
LinkedIn's about section is a great place to copy the summary of your qualifications from your resume. This would include your summary of your key accomplishments and attributes. Again, as Jill mentioned earlier, keeping it clean, clear, and concise applies. It's a great idea to also list, um, thank you, Jill, to also list your work experience as you would on your resume from your most recent position to the oldest. However, LinkedIn doesn't need to be as detailed as your resume. Highlight just your key responsibilities that pertain to the jobs that you are targeting. Typically what we see in LinkedIn is we would encourage you just to do a few bullets for each position and that's, that's sufficient. One feature that LinkedIn offers that your resume does not is in the reference section. And this can help you stand out. And it's one of the tremendous resources and value, I should say, that, that LinkedIn offers, or it will showcase how you could add value to an organization. We would encourage you to pursue three to four glowing recommendations. Those recommendations could include your peers, professors, supervisors, and or your managers, which are excellent. In order for you to ask for recommendations on LinkedIn, you must first connect with them as a first connection. And then you're able to send out that note asking for a recommendation. So I'd also like to just share a little bit about the LinkedIn invitation feature. When you invite people to your LinkedIn network, you're limited to 300 characters. So when you grow your LinkedIn network, and we'll talk about making those short and sweet, but when you want to reach out and connect with individuals and make yourselves you know, more found, I should say, you want to continue to build that network. And as you do that, you might want to reach out. One idea would be to reach out to a potential hiring manager or recruiters and, you know, grow that network. So we listed here an example of an invitation to a hiring manager where let's say that Nelson Brook is targeting this specific company. So he includes the name. And then I see that XYZ Mining is looking for a geotechnical engineer in Tucson. Your mine expansion project is of high interest. My recent internship and degree could help contribute there. Would you be open to a brief conversation? I appreciate your help and LinkedIn connection. Best and then your name. That's just one example of keeping it short, sweet within that 300 character limit. So Jill and I also at the end of the presentation will include our LinkedIn information so that we can connect with you all and be happy and delighted to do that. So Jill, next slide. All right. So we wanted to just review with you all just some general recruiter tips from our vantage point as recruiters. One of the areas that Jill had mentioned earlier on a resume is social media. And, or I should say resume is just having a hotmail, not doing hotmail rather, but you know, having a good Gmail account. So with your social media account, we would encourage you just to keep, you know, make sure that your URLs are clean. Um, take a look at all those. A lot of hiring managers that we work with do actually peruse people's social media just to see how professional the candidates are. So we would encourage you to have professional, you know, photographs, keep them highly professional, the content there as well. And you can tailor uh, your URL with LinkedIn as well, just to your name, so you are able to edit that. And regarding the cover letter, this is an area that, as Jill mentioned earlier, we, we disagree. So I actually prefer a cover letter. And why, for me, I find them beneficial is it can show why you're interested in a position. It tells me a little bit more that a resume doesn't always illustrate but I agree with Jill, make sure that the data you're pulling out is also on your resume. And if you are going to do and write a cover letter, make sure, you know, you check for spell checks, do your homework and tailor the cover letter specifically to the position that you're applying for. Because one thing that when we see a cover letter that is a template and it's just very generic, those really don't enhance your ability. I think they actually could hurt your ability to get the to move forward with the interview. So I just wanted to mention cover letters a little bit deeper. In terms of business cards and resumes and being prepared, when you go to networking events, and we had mentioned that networking events is just one of the greatest avenues for you to find a position. 
uh, have a business card if, if you could prepared or a resume handy. Uh, recently, when Jill and I attended, I was at the GSN conference, I noticed a number of individuals, or at least a few, which was a new, um, I hadn't seen it before, gave us cards that had their QR code that would take us right to the resume, which just is a handy way for us to quickly be able to learn more about them, you know, see if we have opportunities that might be of, of a match for those individuals. So we would encourage you to do that. Or again, have a resume following up um, is a great idea with a, you know, thank you as well. That leads me to the next bullet. I was going to say opportunity. Opportunity, oh, you're, you don't know where you, you could meet somebody, you know, could be in an elevator, could be again at a networking event. So always be prepared, have a list of, list of questions and a list of the target companies that you're interested in ready. So a couple of those questions that you might want to have in your pocket, how long have you worked for your company? You know, what are some of the challenges that you face? Uh, what positions are you having a tough time in filling? What is the hiring process? It's a great idea to find out, do they work with recruiters? Do they, do they just have people apply online? So the more you can learn about what their process is, the better. And enthusiasm goes so far. So when Jill and I meet candidates and they show their interest and their enthusiasm towards an opportunity, we certainly remember those individuals they are going to stand out. And we find that people who are happy and are excited about the work that they do, maybe they don't have all the complete skill level. Maybe they don't check all the boxes, but if they have the enthusiasm to learn that goes so far. So we would encourage you to do these, these areas and Jill will move to the next slide. So once you have identified the positions of greatest interest and you've determined the targets on your roadmap, you can begin to apply a number of combination, or I should say a number of these or a combination of the avenues we mentioned to assist you with your search. It's a great idea to set weekly goals for yourself. They will help you stay focused. They'll help you stay consistent. And we hope that the avenues that we provided today showing you some strategies uh, will help you in your job search. And we appreciate you all for tuning in. So next slide. So this will be one of the ways that you are all, we, we, are, we added our QR codes, which I have to say, <laughs> we were excited about since this is something we are just playing with as well. So if you want to connect with Jill and I and expand your LinkedIn networks, we would greatly welcome the opportunity to do that. And Jill, any, any notes on your end as we close? Well, we, we thank you for attending today and, and we're proud members of SCG ourselves. Um, look forward to seeing any of you in, at, in August at the webinar, but now we'll just turn it over to questions and stop sharing. Thank you for your attention today. Thank you, Jill and Jolene. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, I kindly invite, invite everyone to submit questions from Q&A function. Meanwhile, I will ask you a few questions if you don't mind. Sure. So uh, what are the most common mistakes that you saw in resumes for specifically for the mining and exploration industry? say that especially in the earlier careers is that most people on their resumes tend to put their responsibilities versus their accomplishments and um, that's really important because it's it's very competitive these days even with the demand you know people are, are looking for multiple resumes when when people have openings so make sure you're thinking about your accomplishments. And that would be one suggestion. Mm -hmm. Just to add to that too, Corey, what I was going to say, believe it or not, as many res resumes as Jill and I receive, we do see a number of them that have misspellings. So mm -hmm. I would just make sure that you double check those, you know, check spelling. And as mentioned in the 
webinar, we do see a lot of resumes that are paragraphed and really tough to read. It's, it's harder for us to read the paragraph style versus the formatted with bulleting. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah. yeah. And I do have another question. So what do you think about highlight, highlighting the resumes for specific jobs? Like, should we have, I, I know that we should have different cover letters for specific jobs, but what about resumes? Should we highlight specific skill sets and specific uh, abilities for specific jobs? Like, for example, I want to apply for a structural geology job. Should I highlight my structural geology experience or should I have one big resume for all the jobs? I, I believe it's good to have a master resume that is always, if someone says, hey, you know, I overlooked you, but I'd really love for you to apply this job that you can very quickly send mm -hmm. in and it's, it's that master list. But when you, especially as you get more and more years of experience, it's important to, to tailor it to a specific job, especially if you're um, not going for an upgrade, but a little bit uh, different kind of a role, you would want to pull out those attributes that would say, pick me, I can do it. Mm -hmm. I agree. I was going to say just having a tailored resume that you can specifically highlight and bring to the top any of the, especially if it's a quantifiable, if you can quantify what you've been able to achieve, put those duties and your achievements right up at the very beginning of the bullets that really tie to the position. Again, we, we look through and we will peruse a resume pretty quickly. So the faster we can see really pertinent information, the better. Thank you. Thank you. So we do have excellent questions from the q &A function. Uh, my first question is that, what do you think about applying for the international positions? Should, how should we tailor our resumes for applying for international jobs? I, I think, well, there's a lot of movement around and a lot of, because of the tight job, um, tight, well, the, the lack of supply in talent right now, people are very willing to take in international candidates for jobs. And I think it's the willingness to, to move. Um, that sometimes is hard to explain on um, a resume, may not be bad to put open to locate. Um, if you speak multiple languages, especially if you're moving from one area to the other, make sure you highlight that. But the work itself tends to be the same. So it, it'd be more in, and that's where a cover letter I would cite with, with Jolene on that there. That's where a cover letter may be willing to say that we're up willing to go to another country to work for mm -hmm. a period of time in this and that, so. Mm -hmm. I would agree. And the cover letter, that would be a great place, Corey, for you, you know, for the uh, resume writer, just to really illustrate for, for the hiring manager, why have you chosen the country? Do you have the language? You know, the more you can show that you have have done the research in there, that can really help. Um, it helps us to know, be able to share that with our clients as well. So I, I, I agree. That's when the cover letter would be great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we have another question from the Q&A function. Uh, what do you suggest for a person who want to get a job as a consultant rather than as an employee? So how should one tailor his or her resume for that? And I guess the question would come back is a consultant for an operating company or like a, moving from a geologist working for a company going to a consultancy who would be hired by the client. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a response. And we can talk a little bit about both. Um, When people are working for consultancies, there tends to be, especially as you get five, 10 years into your, your work experience, there tends to be um, more emphasis on the projects you've done and the diversity. So I wouldn't take away from the chronological, but you just would probably want to add those 10 consultant resumes tend to be longer because they're more project-based but still keep the chronological so people can understand, oh, that, you know, 
I worked on an operation in Mexico last year, but you know, three years ago, I was over in Ireland doing something. Um, so, so keep it chronological, but you can put those bullet points under the work experiences you've had. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered the question. Um, one, I was going to just advise too, if you have a LinkedIn profile account, and let's say that you want to move from an operator into working in it for a consulting company, and you have a good bandwidth of experience, and really your, your goal there is to work specifically for a consulting firm, you know, maybe mention that in your summary or in your about section. So recruiters see that and can find you or right at the top under the titles that we had shared, you know, put consulting, um, consulting opportunity, if you can help showcase that that's what you're interested in and why, you know, I think again, a cover letter or being able to maybe illustrate in your about section on LinkedIn as to why you're seeking consulting to get maybe the variety. So you have, you know, maybe having that different, being able to work with different commodities or, um, you know, doing pre-feasibility studies, getting more detailed. So the more you can help us understand why you want to target that and what your interest is there, that will help us to share that information again with our clients as recruiters. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we do have another question. Uh, does letting potential employers know that you can drive manual transmission, transmission matter? Like it sounds like this can be important uh, in exploration and for field work. It's a necessary skill. What do you think about that? Well, that's a good question. And I don't know that I've ever seen that uh, clearly uh, stated on a resume, nor have we ever had a client specifically ask that. So um, that's a new one after 17 years of recruiting. Haven't heard that one. So <laughs> I would say most people, there's such a, uh, there's a lower, um, lower, reliance on on manual transmissions but you know and i can't think of even any exploration roles where they said you know you need to be able to ride you know drive a trail bike or something like that so um that's a new one jolene do you have some better words of wisdom than i <laughs> sorry I, I wish i did jill <laughs> you, may, you with your background uh being a little a little stronger in the mining side. No, I'm sorry. And that's one I have not been asked either. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we have another question. Uh, how important is it for students and early career professionals to attend conferences, either in person or virtual, to develop networks and outreach? Do you highly recommend that? Go ahead, Jolene. <laughs> This is an area I will tell you as recruiter, as, as since I've been a recruiter for 25 years, I have placed so many folks through the years that I have met at conferences. So I would highly encourage when you can attend in person, those in-person relationships go so far when we really take the time and get to know people. And, you know, it, it's so tremendous uh, for us and as recruiters. And that's why Brooks and Nelson, we, I mean, Jill has us attend so many of the different conferences. We have a big team and we are frequently at those and, and, and it's such a tremendous resource for us to find talent. So absolutely the answer there is yes. Go to as many conferences, attend as many luncheons as you can attend. That's one of the best avenues to build that network. And, and again, you know, networking is proven to be the best way to find a job. So that's why we encourage people you know, get out there, meet as many people as you can. And especially when you go to those technical presentations and you learn more about the company, that's another great way to see if those are organizations you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and to add to that, um, I think as young professionals, uh, I am involved with the Colorado School of Mines um, and on uh, <laughs> um, a master level class where, where the students are required to go to PDAC and they are required to meet 30 people. And that is to start pushing people beyond their comfort levels. When you go to those conferences and conventions, like Jolene was saying, is it's also meeting your peers, um, your mentors, um, those sorts of people. So especially if you go to a lunch, say there's a luncheon, um, a lunch and learn, sit at a table where you don't know anyone. Don't sit with your buddies and make sure you have your your business cards and your 
pocket just because people don't remember names and in a car transfer helps us say oh yes that was that person that sat there and had worked down in chile and wants to come to the states whatever um but the other thing too is what what jolene said earlier 80 percent of your career changes will be because of the people you know not because of as much as we'd like it to be a recruiter it'll be the people that you know and you've ran across so Great question. Um, we highly, obviously, highly encourage you to become active in your industry. Yeah, yeah I do agree with you. Thank you very much. So we have another question from the Q&A function. Uh, what do you recommend for a person who want to change their, uh, who want to make a career shift? And what do they have to highlight in their resumes and bringing from their previous career? That's a great question. I'll take a stab at that first, Jolene, because I've done that. And I was a mining engineer and I went into the waste industry, as was mentioned. Um, what you need to do is, is really think about, especially if you have a, a, that shift you want to do, if it's a geologist to an environmentalist or something like that, is think about the things that you've done that's, that's real, that relates to those skills is, you know, there's um, even on an expiration rate, there's a lot of environmental, as we all know, concerns that come there. And if you were that steward or that champion, whatever those even soft skills are, you know, team, team members, ability to learn new things, um, those are good things to emphasize. And again, in a cover letter, as well as your resume, it's another time when a cover letter is good is I am looking to make a change and here's why, and here's what I bring to the table. And you'll see that in my resume. So great question and uh, never talk about wonderful careers is saying yes to different opportunities or putting your hand up and going for them. Good on you, go for it. I would just add to that too. I also made a career change. So I started my career as an accountant and I realized after six, seven years of doing that, that that was not the field for me. So I transitioned into recruiting and what I did to do that is I did write a very targeted cover letter and I explained and illustrated how my accounting background could add value to, you know, to getting my foot in the door to interview. And really, if you just, your, your goal there is just to get the interview. Once you can get the interview, you know, and they see um, what you can achieve, I, I really believe the best companies know to hire people that have, that know how to get things done and are solutions oriented. So if you've done it in one field, you can do it in another. And I think the key there is just to show that your value can transfer. So anything that would transfer to the other position, make sure you're highlighting that in your summary and your resume, doing that on LinkedIn, and then building your LinkedIn network around where you want to go, where you want to take the next step is a great way to utilize LinkedIn. Thank you very much. That was a, that was an excellent answer. So we have another question from the Q&A function. Uh, is it traditional to have graduate school as a gap in employment work experience or should one use it as a way to present general skill sets developed during that time? I, I think um, it is very traditional to have graduate school. And it's, I wouldn't say it's a gap. It's often it, many people, especially if you worked for a bit go, and go back to grad school versus pursuing it right after your bachelor's is that is absolutely considered um, building on your career and your employment. And especially if you have a bachelor's in geology, it's so important to get that master's or that MBA at some point. So whatever it is, is and certainly during that time, put down those accomplishments you made of even if it's your soft skill sets, but, but that is a very understandable gap. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And wherever you're spending okay. time, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, Jill, I was going to say wherever you're spending time with your thesis, you know, you're gaining mo more exposure there. So the more you can share with us about the achievements, as Jill just mentioned, the better that that's really helpful. So we see resumes like this all the time that don't have a tremendous amount of work history, but they have, you know, maybe they pursued their PhD and, and have their education as their main points on their resume. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we have another question. Uh, 
What do you think about adding work experience unrelated to geology, helping supporting personal skills or like, do you find it irrelevant? Say the first part, I'm sorry, could you repeat the first part of the question? Uh, yeah, of course. Sorry. Uh, does adding work experience unrelated to geology help in supporting personal skills? Like having a career uh, other than geology, does that help for one to improve his skills in geology? I believe beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And through life, you know, people that, especially if, if they have an early career in retail, um, you know, they learn management, they learn customer service, say, you know, there's always transferable soft skills that are learned throughout that. And um, I absolutely believe it helps. Um, we like seeing that, especially when they take off and, and relate because it's about dealing with people. And that's typically where people, we struggle on our resume to, to convey that we are team players and can work and support the efforts and, and you know, beginning supervision, stuff like that too. So absolutely, mm -hmm. um, careers build on each, on, on it. And we all take different paths to get there. I think that also shows if they were, let's say you're going to school and you're working part-time, it shows commitment, dedication. So, you know, maybe you stayed at the same company for three to four years that shows loyalty. So as Jill mentioned, you know, those soft skills and some of those other areas are tremendously helpful to show employers what your, what value you could bring to the organization. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And what do you think about uh, having a separate section for courses, workshops, and professional trainings? They become a, a very important thing after the COVID. Uh, they become virtual and everyone had the chance to attend virtual professional trainings, workshops, and courses. What do you think about adding them into the resumes? Um, I, I believe the younger you are from your graduation, if you're, you're coming out of graduation, both master, master's, bachelor's, even a PhD, it's more important to put those in then. It becomes less important, but what's in, what people wanna see is you're getting your Six Sigma, you're getting your PMP, um, you know, maybe there's a, a certificate sort of program that you can um, take advantage of. So getting something that is credentialed is, um, hate, hate to be a Debbie Downer here, but is, is more preferred uh, than attending a, bun, a, a, a lot of classes, especially as you get five to 10 years out. Um, it shows continuous learning, but yet I think it's better to put a lot of accomplishments that you're doing during your career in that over you know, a lengthy uh, webinar series. I agree. Thank you, thank you. And we do have a final question uh, from the Q&A session. What do you think about the people looking for part-time remote work, such as after returning to the mining and exploration industry after having kids? <laughs> well, this is something that Brooks and Nelson takes pride in because several of our people, um, we have a team of eight and probably half of those are working remotely with kids part-time. I think now in post COVID, that's the wonderful thing about what we've been through is people are really, really open to remote work, you know, part-time work, you know, the consultancies in particular um, can balance that. Um, yeah, so I think it's a really good point in time to, to do that. And I encourage, especially um, young parents is it's hard to balance kiddos and work at the same time, but try to keep your foot in the door and keep that technology, that degree that you earn active. So good luck to you on that. I would agree. I was just going to say with the dearth of talent that we have right now in the industry, this is a great opportunity to really look at those part-time, you know, try to, to, when you market yourself in with a cover letter, target it and just explain what you would be able to do on a part-time basis. I think this is the time to, to attempt that, especially like you said, post COVID. Thank you. Uh, we do have a final question, <laughs> one more. Oh, so what do you think about the lab certifications from the former careers? Should we uh, include them into our resumes? If they are readily 
renewed. So like if you have your MSHA training, like for instance, mine's really lapsed. I'd take 40 hours over, but if I only had to take an eight hour refresher, um, yeah, I might include it. Um, if it's something where you have to invest as much time to reactivate it, probably not. Um, if it, however, with the caveat, um, if it relates specifically to the job that you're applying for, um, and I saw on the question that was hazmat. So if, if you're going on a site where, where that may be relevant and helpful to have someone with had, hazmat training, even if it's lapsed, then I would. Mm -hmm. Very circumstantial. That's a fuzzy answer. <laughs> yeah, you're all right. Thank you. And what do you think about the uh, privacy of data share during the application process? Are there any concerns for that? There's a lot of concerns. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, we're not attorneys, right? So, uh, but we, yes, I mean, there's so much that people can't ask. So if, a, if you're in an interview and you are open about your ability to relocate, your ability, you know, if you have a family, whatever else is, no, we can't ask those. So I'm, I'm not sure that that's addressing the question, um, but those are things that are helpful to know, but those can't be asked. And there's lots of boundaries on what can and can't be discussed. And there should be very much um, in the business we're in, and we talked about the ethics, is loose lip sync ships, right? The confidentiality, when we're told certain things, it's between us and our clients and our candidate, but it doesn't go outside that. So not sure that that answered the question completely or Jolene, if you have something to add. You know, no, I, I really was just gonna say when you are applying to just the information when you're especially applying online to say a larger firm, I wouldn't be concerned about that. You know, sharing your information on the application process is fairly um, routine. But when you are talking to hiring managers and recruiters, um, right, there are just some boundaries, as Jill mentioned, you know, we, we don't, we can't ask certain, like, for example, you know, salary in Colorado, we can't ask you specifically what salary range you are currently at. So there are definitely guidelines. Mm -hmm. But applying online, I would tell you that that's, you know, fairly, since I worked at Northrop Grumman. Uh, previously, we were accustomed to seeing people's information. Um, it would go into HR. It was very, when you're applying online, it's typically, you know, I, I would feel fairly safe. I mean, we're not cyber experts, but, but you know, that's where I would, I, I think that's just primarily customary of applying online. Thank you very much. That was a great explanation. I think we hit the end of the questions. Uh, I learned a lot from you. That was a great presentation. Excellent questions and answers. Uh, thank you very much again. Thank you, Jolene. Thank you, Jill. That was a great talk. Thank you, Corey. Thanks everybody for joining. Yes, it was a great pleasure and look forward to seeing you in August. Uh, we are incredibly, incredibly excited to invite everyone to the SEG 2022 conference that's being held on the front range of the Rocky Mountains in Denver, Colorado. Taking place at the end of August, this conference will be both virtual and in-person and focus on a number of relevant themes related to the future of the minerals industry. This is a great opportunity for students, early careers and seasoned professionals alike to come and really immerse themselves in our science and industry. And note that registration will be opening this week some superb workshops and field trips are being planned. And yes, real in-person field trips will be happening again. We hope to see many of you there. The Society has a number of exciting virtual events planned for the coming months, including June 2nd, Julie Rowland and David Davis will be hosting a summary and discussion on SEG Review Volume 21. Applied stru Structural Geology of Ore Forming Hydrothermal Systems. This free webinar will provide mini lectures and by key authors followed by live discussion and Q&A with the editors. And the 20% discount of the volume will be made available to all who attend the event. 
And on June 14th, we are, host we are hosting the second installment of SEG's exploration and technology series, focusing on machine learning and big data. Join our distinguished panelists as they explore the evolving roles of these technologies in exploration and answer questions from the audience. This event is specifically focused on students and early career professionals, and it's sponsored by MapDeck. I would like to thank again, Jill and Jolene and SEG for hosting and then all the attendees and members. Thank you very much. Hope to see you on the next webinar.